First time I went to Varnum Town, I went to see the fort, Dale Varnum's fort. This is Corey Duber, the North Carolina state cop most responsible for taking down Dale Varnum's drug operation. I uh, decided I needed to see with my own eyes. And I drove down there, and sure as hell, there was the fort. That, that's where Dale Varnum was moving cocaine from. It was basically a compound with fencing 10 feet high, I'm guessing, that had fake cameras on the fences. The cameras were not legitimate. They didn't work. Uh, but they were meant to look like they were working. It was very, very surreal. I love a fake camera. Who doesn't love a fake camera? It's it's so affordable. You don't know if it's fake or real. Unless you get up real close. If the point is to make people be aware that they're being watched, fake camera works as well as a real camera. 100%. And it's much cheaper. Much cheaper. If those cameras actually worked, Dale might have known that there was a cop casing his place. I actually stopped the car and got out. And I walked around Dale Varnum's compound, unbeknownst to him, and I was attacked by a turkey. Dale had an attack turkey. An attack turkey? That's right, an attack turkey. I walked towards the garage and this turkey came at me. Scared the crap out of me. (laughs) So I decided to take myself out of that situation real quick. He, He is a dangerous, unique individual. Let me get this right. A high-powered state agent shows up at Dale's compound to investigate this reputed drug kingpin, and he's driven away by a turkey. An attack turkey. Let's just be clear. There's a difference. Do you think that what makes Dale a dangerous, unique individual is that he has an attack turkey? Who expects an attack turkey? No, nobody. (laughs) No, nobody. (laughs) Like, what kind of supervillain has an attack turkey? Well, one in Varnum Town. How is he possibly going to take down a drug running operation if at the first sign of challenge, like a turkey trots out, (laughs) how is he possibly going to take down Pablo Escobar if he can barely deal with a turkey? (laughs) Well, in this episode, we are going to go deep with Corey Duber and try to understand what was really happening in Varnum Town. Besides attack turkeys. Oh, oh no. We're going to spend the entire episode talking about attack turkeys. (laughs) Get ready. Welcome back to Varnum Town. Okay, after the turkey incident, <laughs> I want to know how did Corey... Like, do- what was his next step? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talk about being green. I, I was green. Duber was working as a uniform street cop in Dallas. But he was actually born and raised in New York City, in Brooklyn and Long Island. We were Jewish. Everybody I knew was Jewish. I did the Hebrew school route and was bar mitzvah. He wanted to become a big league detective. So he started looking for openings. I needed to get to a place where I could grow. As a street officer, you don't really work on cases. You respond to calls. And uh, I felt like I was spinning my wheels. Next step was a major police department, something like uh, New York, L.A., uh, where there was all kinds of avenues to grow within the detective division. But his wife was from North Carolina, and she wanted to be closer to her family. So Duber landed a job with the State Bureau of Investigation. And soon after he was hired, his superiors told him that there was great news. They were tapping him to lead the investigation on Varnum Town. I had no sense how big it was. I had no sense on how to investigate it. Um, It was uh, like a whole new world. So why in God's name did they ask this young guy from New York to run the operation? They were looking for an agent to be in charge, and I happened to be in the area, and I didn't have a caseload. I love the interview process here. Hey, are you in the area? Check. Yes. Uh, Are you doing anything? No? Great. 
You're hired. You're leading this major investigation. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't ask me. Yeah, you were in the area. I was down there. I mean, I've done a lot of detective work in my career. Yeah, they, they, you were. How was your kid? You were busy. Their loss, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Duber was detailed to Mike Grimes in the DEA, but Grimes was a little confused. And uh, I can remember at first, you know, Mike saying to me, you know, they're giving me a a guy that's green to do something so important. So a street cop from New York by way of Dallas ends up assigned to investigate Varnum Town. It kind of seems like nobody wanted to go to Varnum Town. Yeah, I mean, listen to how Mike Grimes describes it down there. There's some inbreeding down. You'll you'll meet some three-eyed people down there if you haven't met them already. They were a very small, connected by blood community. Corey Duber again. Everybody was married with, within the, the families. I mean, it was, it was a lot of first cousins getting married there, and uh, everybody knew everybody. So, in hindsight, maybe it was helpful that Duber was from New York. I mean, he wasn't tied to anyone and therefore less likely to be corrupted. That's a good point. That's, that's actually pretty important, considering the corruption within law enforcement inside and around Varnum Town. I agree. But the problem from an investigative perspective for Duber, is that very hard to disappear into the crowd like he could do in New York and possibly Dallas. I mean, there were really only 300 people around. Right, right. Uh, In a big city, you can blend in. You cannot blend in in Varnum Town. No, there's 300 people on a block in New York City. (laughs) It's easy to blend in. I wonder how he thought he was going to do it. (laughs) Let's find out. If a car went by that wasn't supposed to be there, it was out in a matter of seconds. I mean, I used, I can't count the cars that I had to use to go in and out of that place because of that reason. You know, I'd, I'd switch cars with other agents for the day. It was just a matter of trying to keep from being seen. Does this actually work? I mean, you drive into a small town in a different car every day. It seems like the locals would notice you even more. I think they would. I mean, if somebody drives down my block every day in a different car, (laughs) I'm wondering what that did they win the lottery? Yeah. Yeah. Where do they keep them? Where do they keep all these cars? Particularly if it's an out of towner in a town of 300 people, they're going to notice who's behind the the steering wheel. Yeah. Yeah. As much as they are the car. It's not like the car is going to like camouflage the cop. Right. Well, we asked Duber if this technique succeeded in concealing his identity. Here's his answer. Didn't work. I was pegged every time I went through that community. This is funny. You have a New Yorker driving into town in a new car every day, and the locals just totally know who he is. Yeah, I, what I'm wondering is what kind of instructions did his superiors give him to, like, help him out? <laughs> I think they were pretty minimal. Well, it was basically uh, watch your ass because everybody's got a gun. Uh, if you're an outsider, they'll know who you are. Um, uh, nobody's going to talk to you. And uh, good luck. <laughs> it was basically the way it was. So he has no idea what he's doing. Yeah, basically that's right. And he's not feeling too good about it all. I was scared, to be honest with you. You know, it was uh, the perception that you see on TV is that everybody has guns and they're just, you know, this was during the Miami Vice days. And, you know, that made drug work look really hard and really dangerous. I can remember when I I was here my first week and I went to a vessel that was down in the Brunswick County area that had brought in about 30,000 pounds of marijuana. There was residue on the boat, uh, but that was it. And now it was our job to figure out who brought it in and where it went and where it was. And I was like, how the hell do you do that? I didn't, I, you know, I didn't know. So how the hell did he learn to operate down there? Well, Mike Grimes, the other outsider cop in the area, gave him some advice. Mike Grimes said to me, Corey, it's like this. Take a box and start talking to people and write down everything they say and throw it in a box. 
and about every week, read what you got in the box, and the pieces start to come together. And he was right. It sounds like it would not work. It sounds like the the switching the car every day technique. <laughs> Here's what would make it work: is if you if you drew, put your hand in the box and drew out just one piece of paper, right, and, and then go around that, that person. Yeah, and then just based on that, you had your suspect until the box is full, and then and then what? <laughs> then do you are you well, done no, when the very, box is full? No, you have to get another box, get a second box. It kind of seems like a fool's errand because even Mike Grimes says people in Varnum Town won't talk. That was not an easy trick getting a rat down there. They were a tough nut to break. It is just the tightness. You don't rat. You just don't rat. No. Oh. So what does Duber do? Well, there's not a lot of choice. He's he's got to try. So he wanders around Dale's compound until he's attacked by a turkey. <laughs> and then runs off. Exactly. That turkey did its job really well. True. And in fact, Duber had a big decision to make right at the start of this investigation. What was that? Was he going to kill the turkey? Didn't want to kill the turkey. So the turkey survived. It lived to fight another day. (laughs) At least until Thanksgiving. Okay. So Duber tries driving a bunch of different cars into town, putting notes into a box, and getting harassed by a turkey. How did he finally make progress? I spent about, I'd say I spent a month doing research on Dale as much as I could. Uh, back then, there was no internet. Um, so I had to you know, do it by foot and try to get people to talk to me and uh, talk to some people he went to high school with. They said he was really a nice guy. They all said he was a nice guy. Uh, that um, he'd give you the shirt off his back. So he goes and talks to some high school friends. Putting notes in a box. Right. And these notes say that Dale is a great guy. Right. But still, Duber feels like he's making progress because these friends of Dale's... Who, by the way, they clearly know that this New York cop is wandering around asking about him. Right. That Everybody knew that the cop was there. Right. But still, Duber feels like he's making progress because everyone says the same thing about Dale's ambitions. Dale wanted to be a big-time drug dealer. I got enough people to know that I was in the right direction. All right. I feel like I'm learning a lot about police work here. That's right. For example, what do you do when the suspect's friends say he is a big-time drug dealer? Well, the answer is you go knock on the guy's door. Knocked on his door and told him that the train was about to leave. And did he want to get on the train or did he get, want to get run over by it? Whoa. Now, I didn't expect that. That is some badass New York City posturing, man. My question is, what is the train? What is he talking you know, about? You know what? It, it, it doesn't even matter what the train is. It's just like, you going to work with me on this or not? And if not, then I'm going to kick your ass. Where is the train going? You're still hung up on the train. <laughs> Forget the train. It's a metaphor. This fantastic show is brought to you by BetterHelp. Well, if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Celebrate the fact that you don't have to become your parents. (laughs) What what could be better? (laughs) You probably still will, but at least you'll know it. (laughs) And you'll be making an effort against it. (laughs) You'll fail, but uh, at least you'll have greater awareness of the mistakes you're making. Yes, and you'll feel good for trying. BetterHelp is an online therapy company that helps match you with a therapist. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Visit BetterHelp.com town today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash town. I did not have... Uh, a case made against him at that point, I guess you'd say I took a shot. We were about to start an investigation and locking up people left and right, and you either want to be someone that's going to cooperate and minimize your exposure to prison, 
or you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. And what did Dale do? He just folded. He says, you got to help me because I can't go to prison because I can't do that. I won't make it in prison. I don't think people knew how soft he was. He was frightened, so frightened of going to prison. I think he thought that he'd be beaten. And he was so afraid of prison and so aware of what he had done and pretty convinced that I was going to be the man that was going to prove it that he cooperated quicker than anybody else. This is so crazy. I mean, is it possible that there's something else going on here? Is Dale doing something to throw Duber off the trail, maybe implicate other people? Or is Dale and Varnum Town being told to fold by Escobar so the feds will be distracted while Escobar moves on to another small town? Hmm. I like that idea that Escobar is just hopscotching across the U.S. from small town to small town, and when one gets burned, he just immediately moves on and tells that town to tie up the cops as much as possible. Right. So how did it all go down? Well, Dale just started giving up names, left and right. I'd wire him up where he would wear, you know, a a voice recorder. So he did that. Uh, I'd say he did it a lot. Probably 50 times. And once Dale started talking, he couldn't stop. No question about it. Dale was very helpful as far as leading me in directions of people who were involved in trafficking narcotics. Dale probably gave me information on 400 people. 400 people in a town of approximately 300. That, wait a minute, something seems fishy, no? Don't you think? Dale is ratting out people that that don't even exist? Do you I, think that's what's happening? I, I like that idea. I like the idea that he's giving Duber fake names. A <laughs> hundred more than live in town. Well, the information actually did lead Corey Duber to real people. You know, we arrested close to 200 people. Duber kept track of every case that Dale was part of. And, in the end, Dale was charged too. He was looking at like eleven or 1,200 years with everything that I was able to connect him to. 1,200 years? I know. Can you believe it? Like, talk about a lifetime sentence. Oh, my God. What's the point, even, of uh, of putting somebody in jail for I, more than 100 years? I never got that. So how long did he actually go away for? Well, you're not going to believe this, but Dale just walked. What? No jail time. That's incredible, and I've got to say somewhat impressive. Uh, the agents that were involved with him went to bat for him including me. You know, I gave Dale Varnum the biggest opportunity in his life. Dale got zero time in jail after all he did. That's crazy. I can't believe it. It, it, Why give somebody 1,200 years if then you're going to let them just walk with zero? What's, it really doesn't make any sense. Now here's where the story takes a turn. Mm. Duber's shown up in Varnum town, right? Right. He's a brand new agent. Right. He's looking to make a name for himself. So he knocks on the door of one of North Carolina's largest cocaine dealers. Well, all of his friends have told him he's the biggest dealer, right? At least in the vision. Right. And so this guy, Dale, just starts spilling names. And for a new agent who's trying to make a name for himself, it's kind of a dream come true. Yeah. And Duber begins to form a friendship with Dale. Huh. I really thought he cared about my welfare. He had a big heart. So I thought I was doing the right thing. And now, in hindsight, I didn't do the right thing because he wasn't the type of person that deserved to have the right thing happen to him. After that initial meeting where Duber told Dale to get on the train... Yeah, whatever train it was. <laughs> whatever train. They started spending a lot of time together, like like a lot of time. I can say I was with him five days a week for three years. I told him that he had to have a driver's license. He didn't have a driver's license. I taught him how to tie a tie. I taught him how to eat properly. I taught him how to... 
do everything that he should have known as a grown man, but he was lacking. I was like a father figure to him. That doesn't seem like a normal cop informant relationship to me, right? Mm-hmm. I just want to check check in with you. No, no, no. That's that's not what the handbook says. Not what law enforcement recommends. But I can see how it's hard to avoid if you're trying to cultivate a source and you know if you're really, really close to them. I don't know. Maybe it is recommended become like a father figure to your source. Hmm. It certainly is going to hurt when the betrayal happens. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Hindsight's easy. And, you know, you learn about getting too close to informants. I mean, it's one of the things that they, they ring into your head. And I always knew I have to keep that line of personal life separate. But at the same time, the man was needy. It seems to me that it triggered something in Duber, that Duber felt like he couldn't say no. True. That, 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 it, hit that some, too, yeah. it hit some kind of emotional thing for Corey Duber, such that Corey would open himself emotionally. He, you know, when you're dealing with an informant, you have to work with them, but seemingly you're not supposed to be emotional. It takes a special person to, to do that, to keep that separate, though. Right. And it doesn't sound like Corey Duber was able to keep it separate. No, no. He needed help in a lot of ways. And I couldn't turn my back on him at that point. I felt like he was helping me. I was doing something that was very important. So I was going to help him. Dale started doing things for Duber, things that weren't quite right. Drive up to my house, and Dale's car is in my driveway. And I got scared. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I didn't know he knew where I lived. Look at my backyard. He's painting my outbuilding. And I said, what the hell are you doing? You know, because that's frowned upon, to say the least. Uh, you know, it was, it was not permissible. And he said, well, I heard you talking to the, the other guys that you needed to, to paint your building, but you were going out of state, so I just thought I'd help you. I said, get the hell out of here. You can't do this. Called my supervisor immediately. I said, look. I want to let you know, got to my house with another agent. There he was, you know. Uh, he meant it out of his heart. But you can't do things like that. It's improper. It's kind of confusing to hear Duber talk about Dale because he says that Dale has a big heart, mm. that he was trying to be helpful. But then he says things like this. He is not a stupid man at all. He's the best con man I've ever, ever engaged with. Okay. So what was the con? Duber explains it like this. We'd eaten some food, and I got up and went to the bathroom. And when I got back, he had paid the check. And I said, what the hell did you do that for? You're not supposed to do that. You can't buy things for me. And he said, well, you know, I wasn't trying to hurt anything. All I was trying to do was pay the bills. After cooperating with Duber and turning in hundreds of names, Dale had one last name to turn in. Can you guess? Corey Duber. One of the things I love about Factor Meals is they make it very easy. They have two-minute meals that arrive at your door. They're restaurant quality, and you can heat them and eat within two minutes. For somebody who wants to eat well, but also eat quickly and doesn't have a lot of time, Factor Meals is a great choice. The math is pretty compelling. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. They are 100% ready to heat and eat, so there's no prepping or cooking or cleanup needed. Wherever tomorrow takes you, be ready with pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. You'll have over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, and veggie, and more. Head to factormeals.com slash varnumtown50 and use code varnumtown50 to get 50% off. That's code varnumtown50 at factormeals.com slash varnumtown50 to get 50% off. 
I want to take you on a journey behind the scenes of the shoe industry, Kyle, where we'll uncover the stark contrast between a premium shoemaker and those simply riding on massive advertising budgets. g Defy shoes are a true departure from the ordinary, and they're backed by a groundbreaking clinical study conducted by UCLA, while others have clung to shoes featuring a run-of-the-mill memory foam sole for the past five decades. g Defy stands apart with its patented and meticulously designed sole construction. This isn't just about absorbing shock. It's like your shoes giving you a high five with every step. g Defy isn't going for the easy way out. They're not just grabbing any old sole off the shelf. They're on a mission to boost the biomechanics of how shoes work, and they're fostering a movement that nurtures your body. Visit gdefy.com now because your feet deserve more than just another pair of shoes. And here's a little extra love for our Varnum Town listeners. Use the discount TOWN for an exclusive $30 off orders of $150 or more. You heard it right, a little gift from g Defy to your feet. Experience the miracle that is g Defy, where comfort meets innovation. And, you know, it, it was kind of like, oh, what the hell do I do now? You know, do I go up to the register and say, give him back his money? Corey Duber wasn't sure how to respond when Dale Varnum paid for his lunch. And then he used that. He told the investigators that he would buy me things, which was so false, you know. Uh, but did he buy me lunch that day? I guess he did, didn't he? So uh, dangerous. Duber was investigated for accepting things like the free lunch from Dale, but he was eventually cleared. Uh, there is nothing worse than being accused of something you didn't do, and you have to sit back and watch it play itself out. It caused marital problems. It caused personal problems. So what are we supposed to make of Dale Varnum? Duber has a strong opinion. He, he is a... Dangerous, unique individual who he'll do whatever it takes at any given moment to get you to believe in him. And you remember what Mike Grimes said about Dale in episode three. He's a Charles Manson. You know, Manson was a manipulator. He could manipulate people. And that's what Dale does. You know, he walked away from 52 years in prison. He's really stupid, but he's got this gift of manipulation. I think it's funny that the number of years that he was facing is always shifting. It's 1,200 years. It's 52 years. <laughs> it doesn't really matter after a certain point. It I doesn't. Guess. After a certain point, it's all the same. I guess the key point, though, is that he walked away with no time. Yeah. I mean, what does this mean about the quality of Dale's information? If he ratted out his own handler using false information, what is the truth? He had this plethora of stories that he liked to tell about things like being involved with Escobar. Yeah, it, it, it was all fictitious, but I didn't know that. I checked out every single one to see if there was validity or not because Dale was a fabricator. He told stories of things that went on that never took place. Which brings me to the conclusion that Dale was a facade of himself. That he was not this big dope dealer. Dale created a mystique about himself for gain uh, in all facets, power, fear, money, uh, womanizing. And he was able to create this facade. When he built that fort, it was like he was pissing in law enforcement's face. Catch me if you can. I got cameras and everything else. You know, dope dealers don't want to bring attention to themselves. You don't build a fort around your own damn property. He built a mystique of being a badass dude. I spent more time going down the ladder than going up. My goal was to go up the ladder, to go after the importers and things like that. Uh, it just wasn't there. You know, that's why the, that's the mystique of Dale Varnum. Uh, but he did a good job at it. He convinced everybody, including law enforcement. And for a while, Dale made Corey Duber a hero. 
I used to, you know, I used to get all these accolades. Oh, you got the biggest dope dealer in the world. I was the first person to say it wasn't that much dope. I was the first one. So wait a second. Dale is full of shit? It seems like sometimes he was and sometimes he wasn't. He did move some cocaine, but, you know, in, in DEA, there's different level offenders. And in reality, Dale was a low level offender. He was not a Class A offender. I mean, people serve time in jail. But it's almost like the whole we are the center of the drug dealing universe was just for fun. Right. To create some drama in a small town. Yeah, like it was just something that made them feel important. And when it started to be less fun, they said, well, forget it. (laughs) Yeah. Let's call the whole thing off. Okay. And (laughs) and And we'll just have Corey Duber bring it all down. Corey Duber says that Dale was small time, but one thing is clear. Dale Varnum became a complex local legend. We heard one story in particular from a number of people. How many times we went to Disney World? This is Amanda Varnum, Dale Varnum's daughter, and she was just a kid in the 80s. And, I mean, SeaWorld was, we went often, and he would make it up as if it was a family trip. Um, then later we found out it was not a family trip. Uh, he went to Florida to pick up, I think he said, five kilos of cocaine. This is Kevin Holden, a local cop from the Varnum Town area. He needed a cover. It was in the summertime, so he took his wife and his daughters with him. You know, they were young, small. And perfect cover on vacation. He gets down there, gets the cocaine, and then he said, man, I didn't think this through. What am I going to do with this bag of cocaine? So I can't leave it in a motel or anyone. So he said, I just took it with me. There I was walking around with five kilos of cocaine in a shoulder bag. At Marine World. Yeah. Yeah. And they got this pool where you can pet dolphins. You go up and you can stick your hand in. Dolphins swimming around. So the kids and all his wife, they're petting the dolphins and everything. He said, I reached in there and I broke off a corner of one of them kilos like that. And, and you could buy fish, you just flip one, and the dolphins would catch them, you know. He said, I took that, that corner, and I flipped it like that, and that dolphin ate it like that. He said, in just a minute, that thing started cutting flips and just doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And the tra- animal trainers come out there yeah. and wetsuits and got in the pool with it, and they opened the gate in the back and ushered it out of there. Oh, <laughs> he got the dolphin high. Yeah. Next time on Varnum Town, it's time to confront the myth of Dale Varnum directly and go knock on his door. Is he a small-time crook? A folk hero? A major narco-trafficker? A fabulist? Or some combination of the above? Are you ready to confront the turkey, Kyle? The attack turkey. That's right. Are you ready? <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm scared to death. Varnum Town is produced by Epic Magazine, Picture Perfect Federation, and Full Picture in association with Podcast One. Special thanks go out to the residents of Varnum Town for telling their story and to Lynn Betts for her help. The Epic team includes Harry Spitzer, Josh Levine, Frank Slodisco, Melise Tussere, Dan O'Sullivan, and Leela Tulin. Additional reporting by Kijin Higashibaba. The Picture Perfect Federation team includes Patrick Waxberger, Ashley Stern, Tyler Nell, and Samina Martin. The Full Picture Squad is Desiree Gruber and Ann Walls. Frank Reyna supported me during production. Original music composed by Jana Bechtolt and Rob Kiesweter. Additional music provided by American Production Music, Epidemic Sound, and Premium Beats. Studio recordings took place at Silver Lake Recording Studios. 